Alright, we're back. <laughs> Gotta watch out for those. Um, yeah, with, with your xenoliths, um, these are the, the pieces of material that are coming up from within the crust or on the sides of um, old older strata that gets pulled into magma as it gets released and so you end up with um, the, the lava is you know, all around the place, it solidifies into basalts or, or whatever the, the, um, the type of material is, it, it wouldn't be basalts, but you, when you date these uh, materials, you need to be careful that you are dating the material and not what was there before, so there's been a number of um, issues come out, I think it was um, Dalrymple, I think Dalrymple uh, did um, a bit of a, an analysis on some samples from I think it was Hawaii and New Zealand uh, some recent recent eruptions where we at least in in our history we know you know how, how old they were and received um, dating results that were, were far far older and he specifically targeted these xenoliths and he basically put out a paper saying hey look guys you know it was like Hey, dude, you know, you got to watch out for these xenoliths, you know, because they're going to get you. Um, so, I don't know where that came from, but anyway. So, obviously, scientific paper comes out, says all this stuff, um, creationists jump on it. Oh, look, there's all these, you know, this is the problem with dating and everything. And they completely misrepresent uh, the analysis. So, I, I thought just a, a cursory mention of, of xenoliths would have been handy. Um, another one would have been, uh, I think, when you start to look at the reservoir effect. I, I didn't think he made it clear enough that uh, when it comes to how we do radiocarbon dating, that it, it's, a, it's actually the atmospheric carbon that, that's the important component of it and, and not any other source of carbon. Because we, we could go and there's examples that, are, are, again, get misused by um, creationists out there where... Um, a freshly killed seal was dated at you know some phenomenal amount or a, a living snail shell was dated I think at 2300 years and um, those sort of things and, and you need to understand that um, the reservoir effect um, that comes into, into play where you're recycling old carbon from the environment so if you've got say a, a particularly a marine environment where the, the water that's circulating to that marine environment is taking a few thousand years to go along the ocean bottom before it comes up around Antarctica, gets into the food chain via the, the smaller organisms, into the krill, into the fish, the seals are at the top of the food chain, all of a sudden, bang, you, you know, you've got a seal that it's, it is absorbing most of its carbon from an old carbon source. Um, and again, you know, so you can get it in lakes where you've got carbonates, the water is filtering into the lakes through carbonates, or you can potentially, I guess, even get it in uh, caves, uh, limestone, a any source of carbon that's entering the food chain that is not atmospheric carbon, because that, that's where we've got the ratio between the, the C14 and the C12. Um, a couple of other things. Uh, I, Ring species, I, I thought he could have done at least a page or two on um, like Encetina or, or Lara skulls or something like that because he, he uses a really good example in there of like uh, species going back in time like a hairpin. Um, and the perfect example of that would have been Encetina uh, where you've got these salamanders that are going up one mountain chain down the other, big valley in the middle and all, all of the different populations can, can breed with the population that's next to them but at the ends of the chain you've basically got um, you do get some, a small amount of hybridization I think so you haven't got complete speciation there but if you wiped out all of the other intermediates ar around that, that mountain chain you would basically um, have a speciation event um, the, I, I think chromosome 2 fusion would have been worth a page or two uh, even though it's been covered a lot, it's still it's still a handy thing. Um, Nylonase evolution uh, in Flavobacterium and then uh, later on in uh, Pseudomonas uh, would have been would have been a great example for some of this stuff. Um, atavisms. He he did a fair bit on vestigials, uh, vestigial organs, but 
he didn't get too much into atavisms, you know, like where people grow tails and that, and how, why is it that we can grow tails or we, we can get hair all over us, but mammals will never have an atav atavism for a feather because it's not in, in its um, phylogeny. Um, we can we can change a gene and, and make a a hen grow teeth or um, basically get feathers or turn its scales on its legs in, into feathers uh, that sort of thing I, I would like to have seen some of that um, a bit more work on the mammal mammal like reptiles to rep, reptile like mammals just to show hey look he, even here's a list here's a list of you know 50 bang you know um, here's a list of a whole stack of feathered dinosaurs. Here, explain that. Uh, he didn't go into that too much. He did touch on um, endosymbiosis uh, uh, towards the end of the book, just in talking about um, chloroplasts and uh, mitochondria, but an extra page or two just to talk about the concept overall. But anyway, that's it for me. Um, get the book if you can. Um, if you see this video in time to catch the blog TV show, bid on this book. Um, I'll actually I'll sign it on behalf of uh, DJM67. I won't sign it, Richard Dawkins, but um, it's for a good cause. Get the book, uh, bid for the book, um, and thanks.